Coming up next on Boston Rock Talk, Dave Wakeling, leader of the English Beat, is back on the beat, on tour always, and he's here in our studio. Hello and welcome to Boston Rock Talk. I'm your host, Jim Sullivan, here with you today with Dave Wakeling, the leader of the English Beat. Uh, welcome, Dave. It's great to be here, Jim. Good to have you here. And there's a chance that the English Beat, wherever you're watching this, at whatever time you're watching this, there's a chance the English Beat will be playing near you soon because you're always on the road. We, we have a bit of a challenge. We want to do a concert of every freeway exit of this great nation <laughs> before the year 2020. We've still got a couple to do, but we've got most of them done now. Yes, the hardest working band in Scar. It was really, I think, uh, this last year or so is because we'd got new songs and I wanted the band on the road mm -hmm. and I wanted to be working out the new songs at sound checks before we went to the studio. And that worked very well. Um, been in the studio. We're halfway through making an album, more than halfway. We've got the music done, half the vocals, mm -hmm. and then bits of brass section to throw on. And now, raise the stakes a bit more. Now I've got the band back out, desperately trying to learn how well we recorded it. <laughs> I can't play that. <laughs> well, you did. <laughs> now you've got to play it and sing and look like you're enjoying it. So that's the, the next stage now. We're... Looking like you're enjoying it. That's the key thing, too. Shh. One, you know, what was it Johnny Cash said? At Roseanne Cash's first record deal signing. It's all about sincerity, darling. And once you can fake that, you can do anything in this business. Well, let me ask you, for you, you're, you've been in this business, as you say, for uh, 30 some odd years. Very odd years, Very odd years. Very, very odd. And, you know, obviously things change over that time. How about your enthusiasm level for what you do from when, say, when I first saw you, which I think was 1982 or so? What's, what's the Dave Wakeling of 2015 like compared to the Dave Wakeling of 2000? My enthusiasm for the stage is much greater than it ever used to be. You know, I used to like being in a group, but frankly, the concert was like a 90-minute noise in the evening that got in the way of the party, but didn't stop it altogether. It's like, oh, sorry, I've got to go and like, do a gig. <laughs> but now, I, apart from special days like today, where I like, didn't eat, didn't sleep, prepare for this in a zen way. Uh, everything's about the concert now. Mm -hmm. So I time my whole day around that so that I can be in the best shape possible to sing as good as I can mm -hmm. and connect as well as I can. And then uh, that's quite a difference really. Yeah. I think to start with, you're kind of scared and so it's a sort of false nonchalance. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You've got a sore throat. You can't even speak. Never mind about sing. <laughs> right. Now I can sing and I don't get sore throats mm -hmm. at all or hardly ever. And we do five or six shows a week. Um, did two shows in a night and managed the high notes. Whoa. So it's just a difference in attitude. It's That's why I'm here now. One thing we should address is that the English beat is uh, not exactly... English these days. You are, certainly. Uh, well, by I nationality. Know, I don't know if I am, really. Well, you've, lived in, you've lived in California for uh, how many years? Like, totally. Totally. For Long time. Yeah. Uh, let's see, yeah. Well, half my life. Right. I think it just happened this year. Right. Half my life. So half I've, your life. Yeah. Now, each day I've lived longer in America. How has living in California changed your life and also maybe your songwriting? Do you think it has? You might feel like you've got more of a broad scope in California. Uh, I don't feel that the urge or interest to be party political mm -hmm. in lyrics, whereas I felt more obliged to in England, or it felt more appropriate. Right. But I think, don't know if that's as much geography as age, really. I've got to that stage where I'm allowed to be the old bloke in the corner of the bar who says what everybody's been thinking, but nobody has the nerve to say, you know. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and also, I don't think this is my last album, but what if it was your swan song? What you got to say, Wakeley? Mm -hmm. What you got to say on your way out? Mm -hmm. On the way of getting kicked out, you know? Right. And there's a few things that I did want to say. And... Um, 
I remember watching wars on television in black and white when I was a kid, and I thought, oh, that'll be all right. They'll have sorted all this nonsense out by the time I'm a grown-up. They won't be doing all of this. World War II was a black and white war, I understand. Well, at most wars in were black and white in England to the mid 70s. You probably had Vietnam in colour, as we far did. as we, we were did. concerned. We did, two yeah. grey armies still, <laughs> you know. I remember yeah. the Six Day War, that was in black and white for England, <laughs> I remember that. And that looked quite good. I thought the black and white suited the desert yeah. backdrop. Anyway, anyway yes, we sorry. digress. Yes. Uh, I thought it'd all be over with, and it's not, it's worse. Yeah. It, or there's more coverage of it. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's frustrating, isn't it? Because uh, having lived through uh, your parents' shattered memories of World War II and then the hippie revolution and then the punk revolution and everything's going to be different and it's all the same. And, uh, and so there's a song on the record called If Killing Worked, It Would Have Worked By Now. Right? I think we could figure that out. Yeah. Um, do you want to start playing a little music? And you've got no, I can't, Jim. I can't bring myself to it, mate. I've, I haven't played in bloody years. This is a sham. They said, "Come on, Dave. He's going to try and reinvigorate you." We'll, we'll tell him you've got shows and you've got songs. We've got but a, I can't do it, mate. We've got I a synthesizer over there. You can just push a button, maybe. And, uh... Well, I'll mime the guitar oh, well, and have is... one of your team play it, and then <laughs> that's what we do live now. You don't play any of oh, it God, now. No. You too. No, they do it all out front, and they put these special oh. effects on it that give it that live feel yeah, that yeah. the kids love. And the kids, they. they you never know the difference. Well, do it. Much. You've got uh, uh, one classic, one new one coming up. Yes, a classic and a new one. There's a very interesting thing on the news in England a couple of weeks ago. They're trying to raise 150 million dollars for uh, a Margaret Thatcher library. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that future generations can, can can know exactly how her reign went down. And um, and somebody wrote in and said, but we have food banks up and down the country with her name all over them. We don't need any more, do we? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting pairing because what you just did, I think, uh, because you've got a song, the beat was very noted for, a political song mm -hmm. back in the day, Stand Down Margaret Thatcher, of course, and then a love song. And you've always kind of been about both, right? Yes, and then they mix up as well. Uh, when Margaret Thatcher died, <coughs> few people, Rolling Stone, and they came to me and Billy Bragg, and we meant to say something oh, sarcastic, you know. Sure, sure. And I said, much as uh, I abhorred her reign, I just wanted to send all my sympathy to her son and her daughter, because it's never a good day when mom dies. Hmm. People were so mad at me. How could you sympathize? I was like, how could you not? <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> it, it created a sort of inner conflict. Yeah, really. I mean, yeah. Because, well, and let me ask you about the two-tone movement, and I guess maybe explain two-tone, because there are going to be people who don't mm -hmm. know exactly what that is. That was a ska movement in Britain that Dave and his band were very much part of. But well, uh, a mixture of black and white youth ideals, I suppose. Um, and also the, the black and white checkerboard that was used as the insignia was also what the police wore. So it was a bit like taking their flag off them and waving it for another reason. Mm -hmm. So um, that I think was part of it, that that sort of got lost in the translation by the time it got to America. Mm -hmm. But police used to wear black and white yeah. checkerboard and the women officers had a scarf, black and white scarf. I would always wanted one of them, never got one. <laughs> but, um, it was easy, I suppose, in a way, in the Midlands, it was an industrial place where everybody had been forced into integration anyway. Everybody's working in the same factories and after a few year, years on a, the track, you, you probably realise that you've got way more in common with the guy standing next to you than what mm -hmm. differences, you know, mm -hmm. perceived ethnic differences or whatever. So uh, Birmingham was quite an integrated city, forced integration, industrial integration, but anyway, it worked for us because we were the kids. And there was the first generation of Jim English kids, like Caribbean kids born in England, mm -hmm. the first generation, mm -hmm. Jim English. And um, that rude boy, sort of shark skin suit look that the Jamaican kids favoured, fit quite well with that sort of mod suited look, which came then that mm -hmm. two-tone tonic suits. Mm -hmm. And that was really the meeting place of it, the nightclubs. And that was our first listen to reggae, something like that, in, I suppose, middle to late 60s. Mm -hmm. 
And then we heard it on the football terraces to keep the skinheads quiet. They would play ska music, the Trojan volumes, one, two, three, mm -hmm. and four. They'd play those albums, especially the Liquidator. That song was used as the theme song for two Midlands teams, West Bromwich and Wolverhampton. Still is, the mm -hmm. team comes on to the Liquidator. Mm. And so we were ideally positioned not knowing it, really. We wanted to make music that had industrial angst of the Velvet Underground and the uplifting noble spirit of Toots and the Maytals mm -hmm. and try and get both going at the same time. So they would be happy and sad, mm -hmm. scary and pretty at the same time. Mm -hmm. We we'll try and do that with the songs as well. It's, uh, the last song we just sang, The Love You Give Lasts Forever, it's about my mum dying. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's a happy song and everybody, Love We right, Give right, Lasts right, Forever. Right, right. So there's like the mirror image of it, the other side of, of the story. What do you learn from it, you know? I want to ask you, I mean, coming out of that movement where I'm assuming there was a fair amount of solidarity with you, the specials, Madness, some of the other groups there, that movement fell apart, dissipated, whatever, at some point. Was it fun to be part of a movement, and then when that is gone, how does that affect your life? How does that affect your songwriting? Well, good question again. Hey, he does ask him, doesn't he? Hey, another Sullivan. It sounds like such an innocent one, but underneath there, a little <laughs> twist, a shiv goes in. Oh. Uh, yes, it was, it was really odd being part of a movement. If you're on the front of newspaper, it's gone two-tone crazy, oh, says yeah. the mirror. Yes. You know, so there was that. Uh, that some people advised us not to do it. Uh, UB40 and Dexys had decided not to do a record on Two Tone, I was told, because they thought it might be too mm -hmm. much of a movement that blew up and dissipated. Right. Fashion of the week could right. be unfashionable the following week. Right. And um, we didn't mind. We thought we'd got something to say and getting through to a lot of people was a terrific idea. We wanted to be the monkeys with John Lennon. That was the idea, mm -hmm. so you go, we're too mm -hmm. busy singing, stop war everybody, <laughs> uh, you know, just when you've got them, 40 million people. We wanted to do that, yeah. and uh, so we didn't mind that it'd be a mass movement. There were some questions, and those questions still linger really, that in some ways, we felt we'd been set up as an organic musical experiment, and we weren't sure whether the specials had been set up as a political statement. And I think to a certain extent it was. It was like the special started two-tone. This is the look. Mm -hmm. This is the mm -hmm. image and everything. And that got so big then, it didn't seem to have songs to follow along with it. So we wondered whether the specials, how it would go. Because mm -hmm. it looked a bit like Bernie Rhodes had done with The Clash as well. It's like, oh, I know. This man set you up with this. Now you've right. got to live it. Right. <laughs> yeah, good point. That's a good and we weren't sure. And I'm still not sure, to be honest, mm -hmm. you know. So that was the danger of it. Was, you know, was it an organic musical movement or was somebody trying to make a point? Right. You know, and I worry having, the, you know, sprung out the working classes. I used to worry about rich kids having great idea for the working classes marching somewhere. And I'm like, hang on a minute, I want a riot of my own. I was like, well, you know, it's all right if your dad lives in Buckinghamshire, isn't it? You can go there, but that it all stinks. I said, but right. The last riot we had in Hansworth, the only thing that it sold was, you know how long it takes to walk to get a bottle of milk now. It's two mile away. Right? It takes you an hour right. to walk to get a bottle of milk. That's right. what the riot got for us. Right. Right. <laughs> so you're worried about that sort yeah. of stuff, you know. That, um, uh, you know I was just worried about these working class movements. So they're very rarely, are they? Anybody with a working... I've had this great idea while I was at art college about a working class movement. Okay. I remember Pete Townsend telling me a long time ago that he wrote My Generation in some posh hotel. Uh, you know, and, he, and he, even then, the irony He of, got it, yes. You know, yeah, but, well, it's, it is my generation, but they're out, they're out there. My, the they're stuttering out. was the best that was, bit, wasn't it? That was Daltrey. He came up with that, I guess. But, yeah. uh, but anyway. Was it like an affectation of uh, amphetamine shit? Jitters. I thought Could it was at the time. They, they, he sure did. That's yeah. right. Good point. I never thought of that. Uh, I, time for more music. Another new one. I'd like to stutter my way through one. Stutter, in the yeah, Star Wars. Yeah, that would make it unique. Star yeah. Roger Daltrey. <laughs> uh, another new one and uh, another old one. Right? Okay. Getting scared now. All right. Okay. I can do this. That's a piece of cake. Stop, 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 stop. And dead. Yeah. Wow. Well, not really dead though, Jim. Just in the song. Don't let any of I the younger that. It's viewers get the idea. Uncle Dave here. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm used to an electric stop on that song. Yes. So it's a, it's, I've not heard you play that. You acoustic. don't often get too many acoustic songs about suicide, really. Not that many. You, no. you go, usually it's the electric they choose. Well, we, we were talking earlier about the only one song, Why Don't You Kill Yourself, which is yes. kind of an acoustic-based song. Yep. But, uh, um, since you've already swollen my ego to the point of overflowing, I should... And the word Jim in that last song, yes, click, yes, click, has been there right since the beginning, that then, one. Then I'll do one, one other thing, and I'll say that uh, I'm... Dave was kind enough many, well, six years ago or so, to invite me on stage uh, for an encore at the Middle East Club in Beautiful. Cambridge to uh, join him singing the dams, neat, neat, neat. Yep. And, what uh, a great club that is. The problem they kick you out as soon as it's finished. Right, out! Well, you were great, out! <laughs> the Boston <laughs> goodbye, out! <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, <coughs> talking about the music that you wrote back when, and its validity today. I mean, one of the things that I have liked, we've talked about this a bit before, and I'll ask you again, why does it stand the test of time? Why do you think it still works, music that was written 20, 25 years ago? Well, I think, one, we really meant it at the time. Mm -hmm. it, it, there, there wasn't much affectation. There's a bit, because it's pop world, isn't it? But yeah. we really meant it. There were songs that were things that we were passionate about before we was in a group, some of it, and and to try and balance it with a bit of irony, because it can't be too po-faced. I mean, life is a bit odd, it's a bit surreal, and not mm -hmm. everything's going to work out right. So you can have strong opinions about stuff. But more than anything else, I think that human beings connect best from their points of common weakness. Mm -hmm. We try and pretend we do it from our positions of relative strength, like, like a man singing about doing it all night long. Really? <laughs> We actually, I think, get much closer to each other when it's like, oh, I screwed up like this, have you? Oh, yeah. And now you have a dance. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a sort of confessional element of hubris and human foible in the songs that, you know, we have these great ideas and half ass the, <laughs> the, execution <laughs> the execution of it most of the time. Well, you know? well, there is that song, I Confess. Yes, <laughs> that, yes. That's, well, and that's really the, you don't really can, I, I confess, I, you know, I ruined three yeah, lives. Yeah, I ruined three lives. But yeah, didn't sure. care till I found out that one of them was mine. <laughs> you know, so I was everybody else is like, oh, well, that's all fair in love and war. Oh, me? That's no, nice. not me. It's a, and it, it's such a beautiful song. I mean, it, it's easy to miss that in the song mm -hmm. when you're just listening to it and you're gliding along and you're enjoying it, you're dancing. It's like, oh, that's what, mm, nice, nice, nice little knife that you've twisted into you yourself know. that time. Well, and it? also, I think. Uh, <laughs> In, in my 20s, and, and you're watching like your first relationships and watching your friends go through it too, and it seemed like when you got in trouble, the first argument had to be about who loved the other one more than the other one loved them. That was what the problem was, you know. So the argument that it was always based about, well, I love you more than you love me anyway. <laughs> and, and the hardest thing to confess is that you don't care, you know. Not that you're like really angry or have any opinion really strongly, you just don't care. Mm. I confess that I don't really care. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. it seemed to be the hardest thing for any of us, in, at least as we was practicing relationships. Um, just to keep the, uh, the bit of the history going too also, there was English Beat and then you and your former partner, Ranking Roger, mm -hmm. did a band called General Public for a couple of years, General right? General Public. Why, what happened there? Why did that not ultimately work? Well, I think he did as much did. as it was okay. going to. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Tenderness and Never You Done That, that first General Public album yeah. had a lot of hits, yeah. here in America at least. And then we got together in the 90s and did one that gave birth to our cover of I'll Take You There, mm -hmm. which That's right. very oddly went to number one in the Billboard dance charts with some robotic dance versions. I don't know how you're meant to dance to it. It's like Roger Daltrey, take you there, take you there. Well, it must be robots dancing to this in Miami, but it went to number one anyway, you know. And um, it started because uh, some of the beat wanted a, a sabbatical. And you could understand it. They, they felt there was more planes than buses nowadays and they were worried that we were going to start writing songs about rocking down Rock and Roll Boulevard mm -hmm. with some chicks on a tour bus right. or something. And they wanted a couple of years off to go and stand in line and buy bacon, and you know, uh, which they did, and then Fine Young Cannibals yes. came out. Right. At the same time, me and Roger had started a breeding programme each, and uh, we couldn't afford 
about two years <laughs> off. A, a breeding program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Babies, Babies, yes. 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 Uh, not again. Uh, no. we, we tried, never worked, never worked. How oh, have we tried? Uh, but no, yeah. uh, so we couldn't afford, we, we'd got families starting, yeah. you know, and we we're like, we can't take two years off. I had uh, already sealed my fate by insisting that the beat was a socialist. My daughter asked me a few years ago, sitting in the Housing Association jacuzzi with another half a dozen snotty eight-year-old kids and she's like tell us again daddy why is it that you you're famous but you're not rich oh that's right you shared oh i'd never heard shared say like a swear word oh, in God. california oh that's right you shared oh, that's, that's, that's gotta be a trip to uh yes Very yeah. much. but um do you still consider yourself a socialist then no. Uh, if you're not a socialist under the age of 40, you've no heart. And if mm. you remain a socialist past the age of 40, you've no brain. No, I mean, we've, we've, we're, you know, we're mammals. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you like David Attenborough? I do. Yeah. David yeah, Attenborough. Yeah, yeah. I like the bird one the best. They're very well behaved with each other. The fish one's OK. But the mammals, oh, it's like watching the Borgias or the Vikings. I mean, it's like... <laughs> First, as soon as they get out the water, shake, and they've got fur, first thing they do is run for each other's throat. Right. Ah, ah, ah. Program two, it's like, how they kill for their young. Ah. We were watching it, and a friend of mine said, well, why do you think we're at war all the time? It's mammals, yeah, Dave. That's, mammals. that's the way we are. That's the way we... It's just the way we was we raised, do. Dave. <laughs> so I wonder whether it is we might be doomed, you know, perhaps we're just dirty mammals who get mad and just have to rip someone's throat out every now and then, and we're never going to get over it. I can't think of a better way to wrap up than with that bit of optimism You know, share. that's right. Um, <laughs> but we can... Uh, Dave is going to play us out. He's going to... I guess you're probably going to save it for later, or or now. Yep. Now you're uh, going to no, not, not, not later. saving it for not much, later, it much Jim. later, Jim. And you're you're coming to play maracas with me on this. I didn't know no, Rosa said you've no, been doing a bit no, of uh, no, percussion make, training. Make hand paralysis. I can't do that. But I, I do want to thank you, <laughs> back for watching Boston Rock Talk. I'm Jim Sullivan. Been your host. Dave Wakeling has been my very, very cheery guest. And today. I wouldn't be here with, without him. I'd have given up years ago. Years ago. He came to visit me in the hospital. He said, Dave, come on. The kids need, I can't do it, Jim, I just can't. I don't like the lights. He talked me out of it. He had Midjur come over and visit me, didn't he? Yeah, Billy Idol, right, he'll right. come and sat yeah, by the bed. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Dave, do it for Jim. If you won't do it for yourself and the kids, do it for Jim. And I did, thank you. Thank you, welcome. Midjur didn't show up, actually, I just said that. So <laughs> Billy Idol did. Billy Idol did, right. With Susie <laughs> Sue, one of his, I remember. But. He was shouting and pointing. It's actually become a, a phrase in Birmingham now to Billy Idol it out. So if you're caught in an impossible situation, you just, what? Just sneer and like, what? <laughs> and it's called Billy Idling Billy it out. That's great. It's a great <laughs> Is that a verb? It's now. It's, it's a verb. Billy Idling it out.